March 9th, 2011, already. I don't know where the time goes. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm here with Mary Lee Schmall. If you don't mind me asking, when and where were you born? February the 8th, 1933, in Baltimore. Baltimore. I was a depression baby, so uh -huh. I was a big surprise. A depression baby meaning, oh, okay. During meaning people weren't anxious to have children. Because of the economy. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. of Although my father was very fortunate in that he worked at the gas, and, well, and then it was the electric, consolidated gas and electric company. Mm -hmm. And during the whole depression, he just missed, he was furloughed for two days. So he always had a job. Okay. So he was very lucky. When you say furloughed for two days, meaning? They, they, you just didn't get paid for two days. So then he was able or free to get, what, work someplace else for? Oh no, he didn't do anything. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I yeah, because you're, you're only, you're only, he was only off two days. Through the whole depression, whereas many people didn't have jobs, like now. I see what you're saying. Okay, so for the depression, during all of that, he was yeah. only out of work, basically, for two, two days. Two days, yeah. Well, that was a very a fortunate thing, wasn't it? Wow. However, times were so much simpler, and I never, I never took anything for granted, material-wise, mm -hmm. because nobody had that much stuff. Right. as we have now, uh -huh. as we feel we have to have. And so we live very, very simply. Mm -hmm. And because you never knew when it was going to end. Right. You know, like even nowadays, if you have a job, your, your business merges with something, somebody else and you're suddenly out of a job. Mm -hmm. So you always have this hanging over your head. And... Um, and so we lived very simply, although we were, you know, certainly all right. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that because I was little. I didn't know. Right. You just I should worry. Just normal for you, right? Yeah, Everything yeah. Just normal for I you. should worry. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't have many playmates because there weren't that many children mm -hmm. born then, on purpose. Oh, that's. There was only one little girl in my neighborhood, uh -huh. my age. And I still keep in touch with her. She lives in Florida. That is phenomenal. That is wonderful. I know. I know. How it's special. Yeah, I should say. Yes. And uh, um, so we, we, we would play together. And uh, I lived in the city. And at that time, it wasn't so built up. Mm -hmm. And there were woods next to us. And, uh, you know, it was just like living in the country, more so than living in Westminster today. Oh, really? That's an interesting experience. Because you have... Those horrible places like Meadow Creek, <laughs> you know, and um, and so it was really kind of rural, uh -huh. almost rural, rather than right. suburban. Even though it was the city. Uh huh. And then uh, it was a restricted neighborhood that I lived in. Meaning only Gentiles okay. could live there. And then, of course, the war came, and that changed a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You had money, but there was nothing to buy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, then the Jewish people moved into the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And, of course, everybody was all upset, all upset at the, about this. Mm -hmm. Because she said, you know, the next thing coming will be, at that time, the Negroes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is exactly what happened, actually. And uh, there was a, a little boy that I was in the second grade with, and <laughs> he lived at 3507 Alamont Road. I lived at 3707 Alamont Road, and you know that I still keep in touch with him. Again, that is wonderful. Uh -huh. oh. We went all through school together, even through Western Maryland. Oh. And then he joined the Army, and he came back to Western Maryland as a member of the RTC. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't know this. Mm -hmm. And my <coughs> childhood nickname was Toothpick. Your childhood nickname was Toothpick? Because you were always I was a little skinny, yeah. Like you are now, you are still, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I was walking across campus and I heard, hey, Toothpick. I don't uh, know. That could only be one person. <laughs> so 
that was a complete surprise for you. Yeah. Like a shock. Yeah. You had no yeah. Idea. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One of those, as soon as you heard his voice, you're yeah, yeah, I, that, you're like, that no, too that thick. <laughs> I, you know, it's got to be low. Uh -huh. And uh, so, so it's really, uh, I've got some old, old friends. I mean, these are people I've known for over 70 years. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It is amazing. And it's rare. Mm hmm. That is so rare. Well, people are so mobile now, you know. It used to be you moved into a house and you stayed there your whole life. I've only ever lived in two houses in my life. Wow. So the house in My Baltimore. childhood house. Uh-huh. Of course, then I lived at, on campus at Western Maryland. Uh-huh. And this house, I've lived here since 61. Wow. Okay. Right. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of immobile. You are. <laughs> well, you're, you're... I mean, there, you know... I experienced the stability that most people don't have now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, going back to growing up in that era, um, uh, being a depression baby, as mm -hmm. you say, so then did that instill obviously some some certain, if you will, values of of oh. money saving? Oh yes. You know. Yes, yes. You know, keeping. I can not squeeze. Wasting, right? I can <laughs> squeeze the most out of a dollar mm -hmm. of anybody. Because that's the way I was brought up. Right. Right. I mean, I just don't spend money that easily. Mm -hmm. Unless it's something that, oh, excuse me, something okay. that, that is lasting. Mm -hmm. Like, my mother always said to me, you always buy quality, not quantity. Okay. So, if you can afford money for a dress or shoes, make sure they're the very best you can afford. And rather than buying two pairs, you buy one. Buy one really good mm -hmm. pair really that's good. Gonna last. And that has served me quite well. That's sound advice you've taken along with you mm -hmm. throughout your that, life. That's always in my mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, <clears throat> I had a friend who was going to buy all new furniture for her living room, and she wanted me to come with her. I said, Nancy, I've never done that in my life. I just can't imagine. Buying a whole new room full of furniture. Uh -huh. It's just foreign to me. I buy one piece at a time. Uh -huh. And when we moved into this house, we owned a sofa bed and a piano. That was it. That was it. Wow. And everybody said, you're moving into that house with a sofa bed and a piano. <laughs> and I said, well, things, it'll come. Mm -hmm. It'll come. Mm -hmm. And we certainly have managed to fill it up. Oh, yes. I mean, and I'm looking around even now. I mean, you have beautiful things, and these aren't just your everyday pieces of furniture you just buy at a no. local furniture store. No, no, you, no. You know, you've got beautiful, beautiful mm -hmm. things. Am I, am I safe to say even antiques? A lot of antiques in yeah. this house? Yeah, I have a lot of antiques, so, yeah. you know. And, um, but I, I didn't buy all of them, but mm -hmm. we did buy some, but one thing at a time. And it didn't bother me that a room was empty. Right. Well, because you appreciated, like, it sounded like you appreciated the idea of what you know you would get in time. Yeah. When you yeah. could. Yeah. We didn't need everything immediately. Which is so not how it is today, right? I mean, even including my, myself. I mean, I know yeah. we've grown up in this generation of just now, now, now. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Got to have it, got to have it. Now, <clears throat> my son is a little bit like me. But he's the kind who, you know, as soon as some, something new comes out in the market, he's got it. And, um, you know, that, that distresses me, <laughs> but it's not my money, so he can do what right, he wants. Right. Well, let's step back again, back to the childhood. Now, I know you said how, you know, you went through the different times where different mm -hmm. um, populations, you know, were coming in. Mm -hmm. um, uh, did that have... Any effect, good, bad, or otherwise, like to to you and your family? Um, I don't know what maybe your thoughts were at that time. Well, um, now, about the time that all this was happening was the time that I was going away to school. Oh, okay. And I think once you hit 18, you go away to school. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, you're almost separated from that other life of yours. You go on to something else. Mm -hmm. So it didn't really affect me that much. Uh, what kind of schooling, like up until that point, so you went off to school, and I'm, by then you're, you're referring to college. Uh -huh, right? mm -hmm. So, 
what was school like for you prior to that? Growing? Well, I went first to an elementary school that was an experimental school in the public system. What uh, they would push, push you all, but they were always, the teacher was always giving me special things to read. Oh. Uh, it was really a very, it was called, it was School 18 mm -hmm. on Druid Park Drive. No school buses. You had to walk to school, and it was a long way mm -hmm. from my house. And uh, it was very competitive. We had a lot of Jewish people. As a matter of fact, on Jewish holidays, there were only two of us that came into school. And we had big classes, 40 people. In, a cl in one class? Yeah, yeah. Wow. But there was, no, there was no discipline problem. Really? Yeah. I mean, we would not have thought of misbehaving. It was it was such a different era. Oh, I mean, yeah. there was a lot of respect for the teacher, sure. and that's that the only be. reason <laughs> that they could have that many people. Mm -hmm. And also, in fact, I gave this this uh, article to my son. Uh, we collected money and bought a fighter plane for World War II. Really? What did you, your school, your class? Our school, our school. Money and and the money. pilot came back to speak to us. Oh. And there was an article in the paper, and I had saved it. I gave it. I gave my son a lot of World War II things. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Because that was certainly a very significant yeah. time to be alive. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And what I can remember is the front page of the paper, and they would have a map on there. And as Hitler would go across Europe, it would be blacked in. And I could remember how afraid people really were, mm -hmm. especially living so close to Washington mm -hmm. and being Baltimore being a shipbuilding place. We were very concerned. We had, uh, you know, the uh, air raid drills. Did you? And we had to go down in the cellar and <coughs> had, you know, big claws across the windows so that light wouldn't shine outside because you got fined mm -hmm. otherwise. And we still had gas lights on our street. Wow. Baltimore was the first town to have gas lights and the last one. Wow. And my father, you know, worked for the civil defense or, you know, volunteered. And he was in charge of turning out the gas lights on the street. Oh, my goodness. And then we all hunker down in the, in the cellar until the all clear came. Mm. And, uh, so we had the air raid drills. Mm -hmm. uh, also, at that time was the big polio scare. Mm -hmm. I remember a girl in my class had got polio. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. oh, little Jackson. <laughs> we, were, we were really concerned. Uh -huh. Sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I can remember that we all had to wear identification tags to school. Every day? Every day. Every day. And if you didn't have your identification tag on, you got into big trouble. Really? And <coughs> this is something I still have. My mother gave me a silver disc with my identification on it to wear it up on Sundays uh -huh. when we went to church or went out. Okay. But you always had to have your identification on, especially in school. Did you find that you said it was a, you know, since it was more of a, um, an experimental kind of a school, so something special. Mm -hmm. How how were you selected for? Were you something you were selected for, or something your parents just were like, "I want you to try"? No, this? it was in it was in a neighborhood. It was in a nice neighborhood, mm -hmm. and <coughs> my best friend went there because her parents were in education, and they particularly wanted her to go there. Mm -hmm. But it w happened to be the closest, almost the closest school anyway. Oh, okay. Okay, so logistically it made sense. But yeah. It gave you, it sounds like this type of school was giving you a better education, more experience. Yeah, even yeah. Then. Well, and, and as I say, there were a lot of Jewish people in our school, and, and they're real achievers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, at that time. I guess they still are. Mm -hmm. And so you get a lot of competition, and that kind of spurs you on. Kind of keep you motivated to, mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. to do your 
best. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But again, I don't get that carried with me. However, I used to get in trouble because I was Miss Goody Two Shoes. Uh -huh. And when the teacher went out of the room, I was in charge of taking names of people who misbehaved. Oh. <laughs> now, how did that, did people, uh, well, it, it, you said people didn't misbehave too much, right, back then? Yeah, no, except when the teacher went out and I was in charge, and they thought, oh, well, you know, we'll so give her a hard time. Did, but did they, did they give you a hard time, like? Some of them did, 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 yeah. Down the yeah, and yeah, sort of yeah. someone in? Yeah, and some of the boys, didn't you know, try to scare you and things like that. Uh -huh. And I had this boy in the neighborhood. I called him an ectomorph. An ectomorph? <laughs> well, he was, and he was always trying to scare me too because I was, I was so shy, and I was just easily, easily frightened. My oh. sister was eight and a half years older than I was, oh, okay. so I was almost like an only child. Oh, okay. That was that your only sibling? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. okay. And uh, so I was easily frightened. And uh, they, of course, they knew it. Mm -hmm. They took advantage of that one. Yeah, huh? they knew how yeah, to get you. yeah. Now your your schooling, okay. So that was elementary. Uh huh. Was the school eighteen? School eighteen. Mm -hmm. So then, how did that differ? Like, did, did you go on to like the secondary, the middle school? We went went junior school? high. We called it. I junior went to Garrison high. Junior High School. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of um, I don't really remember much about that. It's really strange. Mm -hmm. And you went there for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to high school, and I had a choice between two. One was a co-ed and one was all girls. And all my friends were going to the all girls one, so I went to the all girls school, okay. which was Western, mm -hmm. which at that time was very, very good school, mm -hmm. too. And uh, I was editor of the newspaper. and. You know, did a lot of stuff there on the student government and everything. Yeah. A lot of exposure to a lot of good things. And I won the German Prize at graduation, and we graduated in long white gowns with red roses. Oh, that sounds lovely. Yeah, well, sh can you see doing that today? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I mean, we were young ladies. Mm -hmm. So that's how you. Yeah, that's what we did. That's Mm -hmm. Well, then growing up, like going through that, and it, like I said, it sounds like you had a lot of um, opportunity. You had a lot of opportunity growing up. I guess that's safe to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I started taking piano lessons when I was six years old. Mm -hmm. And it was before I had had much about math or fractions, and my piano teacher really kind of taught me fractions. Oh. You know, three-quarter time and uh -huh. that sort of thing. So that's where I got my first, you know, math. Math lesson. Yeah, yeah, your yeah. Uh -huh. Very nice, very nice. And so, and then I used to earn money by babysitting, mm -hmm. a dollar a night. Mm -hmm. Good money. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, we had a friend who was a musician, and she used to accompany recitalists. And there was a recital hall down in Baltimore, and I forget what it was, but. I used to turn pages for her in the recital, and I'd get paid there. So I was always squirreling away money. Okay. So I always had money, and my father would come, well, can you lend me a couple of dollars before <laughs> payday? <laughs> so wonderful. Right, right. So, wow. so I, was, I was pretty busy as a, as a kid. I, I didn't do much in athletics. Okay. I was not athletic at all. And then I had a, developed a thyroid problem when I was 13, and I wasn't allowed to take gym. Oh. Oh, okay. So uh, what I did was play the piano for the dance class. In, in lieu of taking your gym class? Uh -huh. That's how you, okay, all right. Well, that was, you probably enjoyed that a lot more. Yeah, anyway, yeah, didn't right, you? yeah, because I didn't care for all that other stuff. Right. And though we did play a lot of badminton. We had a badminton court in our yard, mm -hmm. and all the people in the neighborhood used to come around and oh, okay. every night in the summertime we'd all play badminton. Oh, that's nice. So your house was like the house to go to, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I mean, nowadays people would have a pool, but in those days there was... And then we had a victory garden during the war. Okay. Can you describe that for me? 
Well, you planted your own vegetables and everything. And <coughs> also, uh, I can remember when I was little, a man from Hampstead would come down once a week to sell his eggs. And then a huckster would come around in a big red truck. And he would have fresh vegetables. And he would come around a couple of times a week. And on Fridays, he had crab meat. Oh, wow. And say so he'd come right to your door. Because usually, people only had one car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not like mom could, you know, go to the store. Well, my mother wouldn't go to the store anyway. Oh, okay. She would not go out. She would not even go out of the house and take a walk. Really? She was supposed to. The doctor said she was supposed to walk, but she felt it was unseemly to be seen on the street. Oh, okay. Okay. So she... So she, you know. Now, my father would take her to the grocery store on Friday nights to get other things. Mm -hmm. But as far as vegetables and eggs mm -hmm. and milk, of course, milk was delivered to the door. Right. And, and the milk had the cream on top, you know, it wasn't homogenized. Okay. So that if you were having company, yeah. you'd take the cream off the top. <laughs> okay. For okay. the coffee. Okay. And, uh, I mean, it, it, just, it was so different. And then, <clears throat> you know, of course, we had ice boxes rather than refrigerators. Mm -hmm. And the ice man would come through with his horse and wagon in the summertime. We would go down there when he came through, and the mothers would buy a chunk of ice, and there were all of these little ice pieces left over that he let us eat. Oh, okay. So you enjoyed that then? Oh, I love uh, that. Yeah. And then the scissor grinder would go through. Oh, my goodness. Hold and that, please. <laughs> he would come and sharpen your scissors and your knives. Wow. And I remember he had all this stuff hanging on him. He walked through the alley, and people would run out with their their uh -huh. knives and everything to be sharpened. Wow. That's so, oh my goodness. I mean, it was so different. That, yeah, it is. It, just listening to you, it, it, I can't even imagine. I mean, it sounds wonderful, really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was. You know? And my father, who died in 1988, mm. at the age of 88, he said, you have no idea living what, through this, this period has done to me. He says, we had horse and buggies. Mm -hmm. He says, and now they're men on the moon. He mm -hmm. says, I can hardly can't, absorb back. that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess, too, going back to to living through that era, and then when you became ready to go on to, to college, mm -hmm. and then you went to which college? Western Maryland. Western right? Maryland. Okay. <laughs> um, how different... How different was that for you? Was that it really wasn't different because Western Maryland at that time was a very religious, middle-class college. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, these are people who come from similar backgrounds, mm -hmm. and Westminster was a very rural town. Mm -hmm. I mean, every Friday night the farmers would come into town, and you'd see them standing around the, the uh -huh. corner. That was a big night for the farmers to come into town. And we never went downtown very much. Um, we had a laundry service where we could get our sheets done, but we would have to hand wash our, our clothes, mm -hmm. and unless you went home every weekend and took your dirty laundry with you, which okay. was a popular thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I think when I was a junior, Somebody opened up a laundromat on the other side of town, and we would go walking all through town with these laundry bags to do our laundry. Uh -huh. That was probably, was that exciting? You know? Yeah. Oh, my gosh, a laundromat. Look at that, you know. Because I can remember at home, my mother had a washing machine with the, with the rollers, you know, mm -hmm. on top. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I guess I'm assuming, too, by the way you've described things growing up, you were probably, did you have, like, I'm going to go back a little bit. Did you mm -hmm. have, like, set things that you were responsible to help your mother with in the house? Or, you know, Not like weeding the garden, which I hated to do. Really? I hated that. Um, I don't recall that I really had much because she was home all day. Okay. And, you know... 
I had to do my homework and practice the piano, so I didn't really do a bunch of the way of chores. Okay. Those I couldn't weed the garden. <laughs> So those were your main responsibilities because they wanted you to obviously yeah, do Yeah, right. Well. well, I think this is one thing. Well, I think there are many things that are wrong with life today. This is one thing I think is wrong is that we over-program our children so they don't have time to focus. And they come to, to college with, you know, this uh, attention deficit mm -hmm. crap. And I don't know that it needs medication. I just think we need a different focus on things. We're all going in too many directions at one time. And there's not enough time for original thought. That's a, that's a very, uh, very valid point. I, and of course, they want to throw computers, you know, at kindergarten kids, practically. Oh, they do. Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. And they get the idea that all the information is in this box. And when I was teaching at McDaniel, I asked one question after one of the labs that required them to use relationships with what they had done in the lab. They couldn't do it. Mrs. Schmall, where is this written down? I said, it's not written down. It's up here. It's not on the computer. I said, somebody had to use their brains to put it on the computer. They think it's, you push yeah. a button. And there it is, yeah. And mm -hmm. this, I think, is wrong if you're in education. Mm -hmm. I think that's very wrong. Mm -hmm. And the politicians say, oh, yes, we got computers in this school. Mm -hmm. Sure, they have to know how to use them. And sure, computers are wonderful, but they're like everything else. They're abused. Mm -hmm. No, that's a very valid point. Mm -hmm. I, I can I can attest to that. Watching my son grow up mm -hmm. and, and and how he is spread so thin, mm -hmm. and, and, and I wonder why they're stressed out. Yeah. Yep. Well, no wonder. So right. So sometimes less is more. Right? Mm -hmm. that, that old saying, less is well, more. Well, now I did go through a period of my life that I was going in many directions at once because mm -hmm. I had a church job. I had my job at McDaniel, and I used to do shows on the side. Piano shows? Like, what um, shows? Uh, Broadway, sh you know. I worked at Mount St. Mary's. I worked at Francis Scott Key. I did Theater on the Hill, and I did September Song. Wow. And one spring, I had a show at Mount St. Mary's and one at Key, and they were kind of at the same time. Mm -hmm. I would work all day at McDaniel, come home and get dinner, and rush to Key mm -hmm. for rehearsal from 6 to 9. At 9 o'clock, I'd get in the car, and I would go to Mount St. Mary's until 1 o'clock. Oh, my goodness. Come home. So I went through a period of my life where I was overly scheduled. Mm -hmm. And then I used to accompany the kids that went to the uh, state competitions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, I was doing all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And everybody says, what are you going to do when you retire? I said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> I'm having more fun. Uh -huh. and, and as a child, um, I, ha well, I had this crazy sister. And I used to try and hide from her as much as I could. And I had a dollhouse, and I had my, my room. And I would go up in my room. So I spent a lot of time alone. And uh, it's not a bad thing. You enjoyed your own company. <laughs> well, it gave me a lot of time to sort things out. Mm -hmm. What do what do I want out of life? You know. And uh, and we had lots of good role models at that time. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is so wonderful about Kate Middleton, because I think she's going to be a wonderful role model for young girls, mm -hmm. rather than Lady Gaga. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Understood. Do you mind, like, wh who were your role models then? Well, my role models later on, after <coughs> I grew up and started, you know, got married and things, mm -hmm. Grace Kelly, Audrey Hepburn, and Jackie oh. Kennedy. Okay, very nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And although Audrey Hepburn was a career woman, she was.
kind of a home kind of person, mm -hmm. and certainly Jackie mm -hmm. Kennedy was, mm -hmm. and Grace Kelly gave up to, you know, nothing wrong mm -hmm. with being a housewife. Right, right. No. Because you really are running a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. juggling a lot of stuff, and molding it into your own. That's right. Now, mm -hmm. growing up in the time that you did, though, was it, w would you say your family situation was unique in that it sounds like your parents, they really did, they wanted you to learn and explore and, 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 and do things like that so it would be different opportunities. So back in that time, was that a little bit out of the ordinary? Because m most, a lot of women then, weren't they more geared to just doing, like what's your mother, you know, being married? Right. Well, yeah. My family. father didn't want me to go to college. Oh, he didn't. No, he didn't. He said, you'll just end up washing somebody's dishes anyway. He oh. was very much against it. Because he saw you, he thought you should just stay focused on mm -hmm. home life, husband, family, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Oh, okay. He okay. felt very strongly about that. And when I went to college, my mother got a job at the old Stewart's department store. Mm -hmm. And he raised such a ruckus that she had to quit in a week. So she got the job, what, to help afford you to go to college? Yeah, yeah, because at that time, you know, there wasn't financial aid or anything. Right. You paid. Right. And while it wasn't much, your salaries weren't much either. Right. So it's the well six of one, half of the other. And um, so he, and my sister became a widow at 42. And he did not want her to go to work, which is, a, she had five children, and <clears throat> she had a real financial problem. And had she gone to school and finished her teaching degree, she would have had a pension, she would have had a life, mm -hmm. and he did not want her to do it. And he used, he used to uh, finance a lot of things for her. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> so he had, he was very, very old fashioned. Okay. He thought it was a disgrace for your wife to go to work. So that's why they didn't understand me at all. Jack said no. And, um, and my husband used to say, you know, I think they gave your parents the wrong baby. <laughs> but, yet, but yet you were, I guess it's interesting just by what I've heard you say so far because you were encouraged, I mean, to, you know, to do the Play, piano and, yeah. and the mm -hmm. different opportunities you had like, through school and things like that. But um, so what, did you know early on in your life that you wanted to take a different route than what your father's, say, expectations were for you? No, I didn't. I, I knew I wanted a certain kind of life. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew I wanted to get married, but I never had any boyfriends. Somebody had to get me a date for the senior prom because I never had any boyfriends. <laughs> and even at college, for the first two years, everybody would go to the dances and I'd be back in the dorm. I just, okay. I had lots of boyfriends, but no boyfriends. Not right. Understood. Understood. And uh, so I wouldn't make it out too well in that area. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but. Uh, just hadn't met the right person yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just hadn't clicked yet. Right. And I went with Craig for two years, and then on graduation day, he dumped me. Everybody oh. else was getting their little diamond oh. rings. I got dumped. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so I was pretty devastated. Yeah. And then he went to Korea, and he started writing to me at the end of his tour. And when he came back, then we became engaged and got oh. married and moved to Chicago, which was another whole unbelievable part of my life. So basically for him, just to step back though to him, I guess that, that old saying, you don't know what you have, don't know what you got till it's gone, I guess. Well, he wasn't away. ready to settle down. Mm -hmm. And so when he got ready to settle down, you, you know, that you was, right, you know, yeah. You, right now. you met, then you met him at, at Western Maryland? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You were a student there as well? Funny thing, there were only 600 students there then, mm -hmm. very small. Mm -hmm. I knew all his friends. I didn't know him from Adam. Really? The first two years, if somebody said Craig Schmall, I would say, who's that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And then uh, I switched from a chemistry major to a biology major, and I, I was in class with him, and that's when I met him. Oh, okay, okay. But okay. it's really funny because I had no idea uh -huh. who he was. Okay. So you graduated from Western Maryland what year? You don't mind 55. 55, okay. Just had my 55th reunion. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. Well, one-third of our class is dead. Yeah. And another third in walkers or whatever. Right. I mean, it's just really pathetic. Right. But that's the way it goes. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Can't live forever. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, true. yeah, uh, Western Maryland was a very different school than it is mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. However, <coughs> I have the feeling that some of the young professors there now feel that nothing happened until they arrived on campus, and that's very wrong. <laughs> Because we had a group of professors who were world travelers, even though they didn't make very much, mm -hmm. and had nice homes, and were interested in a lot of, th we had an English professor who was an opera buff. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and they were just really liberally educated people. Mm -hmm. Now you're referring to, are you referring to when you were st a student? Student. Mm -hmm. In Western Maryland, mm -hmm. you could see that in, mm -hmm. in your professors. Mm -hmm. Very good. And we used to have the National Symphony every year come up. And all the professors would be there with their wives. There were many um, uh, affairs like that in which they would come mm -hmm. and, and interact with the students, which I don't think you have now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, everything's different. Yes. Everything. Mm -hmm. Now, you graduated in 55. Mm -hmm. Then what what did you see for yourself then at that point? Well, I had um, a job waiting for me at Johns Hopkins Hospital okay. in the clinical chemistry lab. So that's what I was looking forward to doing. Okay. I thought, well, geez, maybe I'll marry, I'll meet a doctor. Doctor, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I loved that job. I couldn't wait for Mondays to come. Mm -hmm. I loved it so much. It was that's really good. interesting. Yeah. And I worked there for three and a half years okay. until I left for Chicago. Okay, which I can tell from what you said before, that's a whole story in itself. So mm. Mm. if mm. you want to tell it, you go right okay. ahead. I don't well, know. <laughs> Craig was going to chiropractic school. Okay. And so we moved out there with all our belongings and a little you haul it thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and my, my mother said, well, you certainly are going to take your silver serving dishes and all my wedding presents, you know, silver and all this stuff. So we had this, all this stuff packed in this little trailer and we lived in the slums. In Chicago? And yes. Mm -hmm. So of course we took it back home as soon as we could mm -hmm. because <coughs> it was the kind of neighborhood that you couldn't go out day or night, even then. Really? Yes. And I worked at Cook County Hospital, which was the pits, yeah. and it was six blocks away. And Craig would take me, unless it was 10 below, and then the car wouldn't start, and I would have to walk. Oh, so if, if it hit 10 below, your car wouldn't start? Mm -mm. That was just a given? Mm-hmm, yeah. Oh, wow, okay. And uh, we lived in a converted Baptist seminary, and our apartment consisted of two little rooms but no running water or bath. We had to share a ladies' room with a hundred other women, and the prostitutes from Madison Avenue would come up. Oh, wow. And, use it. Yeah. and the man across the hall had a gun collection and beat up his wife all the time. Oh. <laughs> and, and people would get murdered and raped right under our window. I mean, oh. it was horrible. It was horrible. And this is this is what 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 time frame? Nineteen fifty-eight. Now, if what when did you get married then? Let me back. Nineteen fifty-eight in January. In nineteen fifty-eight. Well, we went to Bermuda for our honeymoon, and then moved to Chicago for him to go to to school. school. Okay. And he was in school for three and a half years. Okay. And <coughs> so what we did was we went down to Maxwell Street, and I don't know whether you know anything about Chicago. I do not. Okay, if somebody steals something from your house 
on Sunday, you go down to Maxwell Street and you can buy it back. <laughs> I'm staring like, what? I'm, I'm <laughs> this is Chicago. <laughs> anyway. Well, okay, wait a minute. I, I have to ask. Well, the thieves all go down to Maxwell Street uh -huh. with their stuff. And if you, if you lost something in a robbery or something, you can go down and look for it there. Oh, wow. So... It's like a flea market yeah, for robbers. For, for <laughs> so it wasn't like, did the police get involved? So no one was Oh, no. Oh, Nobody the police are the worst of all. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're terrible. Oh, my God. I mean, it's just such a crazy city. Uh -huh. When we drove in to the city, the first thing we saw was a little boy in a Boy Scout uniform with a screwdriver prying open a parking meter. That was your first? That was our first Your impression, first impression yeah. of Chicago. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, it's a wild place. And uh, so uh, we went down on Maxwell Street and we bought a sink and two big five gallon jugs. And we had, we made up a siphon from our lab experience. <laughs> and we had a jug of water on top of the refrigerator, which we bought for $15. And then we had the hose going into the sink with a funnel and an empty jar underneath. So we had running water. Wow, okay, all right, all right, my goodness. Crazy, and then he'd have oh, to genius. empty it. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, every time you wanted to drink water, you wanted to wash your hands or something, you'd have to get down the hall. Mm -hmm. And this guy was throwing his wife all around and you just never knew what was going on. So. You want to stay inside in your apartment as much yeah, as possible. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that that was quite an experience. Oh, it sounds like it. So I bet those did those three three and a half years seem like oh. forever. <laughs> I said if I'm ever if I'm ever um, terminal, I'm going to come out here and live because every day seems like a month. <laughs> yeah. It was just awful. So then, what were you doing then? I was working in a lab in, in Cook County hospital. hospital for six horrible months, and then I got a job at Rush Presbyterian, which was across the street. Mm -hmm. There was a big medical center right near there with the University of Chicago Med School, University of Illinois Med School, Loyola School of Dentistry, uh, several hospitals. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I just walked across the street and applied for a job, and I got one there, and it was a very nice hospital. Oh, okay. What about any kind of any kind of social activity that you would try to get involved in, or or did you like I said outside of work you just kind of stayed put uh, because of the area? Not really. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we would get free tickets to the symphony through the hospital. We would go there. Mm -hmm. okay. But of course we didn't have any money to do anything mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. because he didn't get the GI Bill when he was in Korea. They rescinded the GI Bill for because he wasn't there during combat. Okay. So all these people who had been in the service but had never gone to Korea were getting the GI Bill, and he wasn't. And so they used to call the day they got their checks Craig Schmoll Day. <laughs> <laughs> he used to be so mad. Oh. Anyway, I got him a part-time job in the lab, uh -huh. and <clears throat> he was on call 15 nights a month, and he would get $10 if he got called out. Okay. But, of course, going out in the middle of the night in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That was, was it not worth the $10? <laughs> you just hoped that he wouldn't get called. Right, right. Did he much? Um, half and half, I guess, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was $150 a month, which was, seemed like a fortune. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, so. sure, absolutely. So. so then that's, let's see, to 1961. Yeah, and then we came here. When you came back, to, you came to Carroll County. Yeah. Well, actually, we, we lived in Linden for a little bit with my parents because he had to take the board exam. Okay. And <coughs> while he was doing that, preparing for that, I worked, went back to Hopkins and worked for a little oh, while. Okay. But we had bought the house, and we used to come up and work on it. And we, like, we bought it in April, and we didn't move in until September. April it, of... 61? Uh-huh. Oh, okay. Because uh, the place was a mess. It had been empty for a year and a half. Oh, okay. And the shutters, uh, the weeds were this high, and the shutters were all lying around. 
and all the radiators had burst, so it was full of dirty water, and oh so it was a lot of work. How did you come to find this house, then? How did that um, somebody in town told Craig about it. It had a for sale sign on the front, but it wasn't close enough to the house that you would ever see it. Oh, okay. Okay. <coughs> So that's how. So not a lot of takers, obviously. People didn't know. No, no. Unless you're from Westminster, you wouldn't know. Right, right. So, so we embarked on that little challenge. Did, was that part of the intrigue? Was because, or, or was it just simply this is that's just what you could afford at the time? Or well, it was eighteen thousand dollars, and we didn't think we could go over fifteen. So we said, well, we'll try it. But the, the uh, mortgage payments are $100 a month. And we didn't have enough for a down payment. So we had some stock in Merrill National Bank. It wasn't Merrill National Bank then, I don't think. That <coughs> we took another loan on. Mm -hmm. And that helped us with the down payment. Because okay. at that time, you had to have a third down. A third? Yeah. Did you really? Oh, uh -huh. OK. OK, wow. And of course, we were out of towners and very suspect. I mean, if you weren't born in Carroll County at mm -hmm. that time, you were not worth it. Okay. So, uh, so we, in fact, when the realtor called the oil company to come fill up the oil tank, they said, well, can you guarantee we'll get paid for this? Mm. So and they just assumed because you weren't from here that right. you weren't going to live up to your yeah, responsibilities. Yeah, yeah. And we were very suspect. And uh, so, uh, I mean, of course, it's much different now because it's not such a closed community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But even though we had been to the college, that was an entirely different entity from town. Gotcha. Okay. So it didn't give you, knowing that you, you, were, you were alumni from Western Maryland. That, that didn't, didn't, that didn't, didn't count. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Especially when they found out we had moved from Chicago. Oh. Oh my gosh, we might as well have said, you know, Iraq. <laughs> right, right. Well, it was kind of like Iraq, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Chicago is one crazy place. Mm, yeah, I've never had the opportunity to go, so. Well, it would be an interesting place to visit. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the curator at the Shedd Aquarium had married a girl from Reisterstown that Craig knew, and we used to go there. And he'd let us go behind the, the tanks and feed the fish and things. Oh, okay. And um, they were very nice to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, but um, I, I we used to go. We joined St. James Cathedral because we were Episcopalian. Mm -hmm. And uh, a very famous composer was the organist there that I didn't realize till I opened the the uh, bulletin. I thought, oh my gosh. And uh, so we would go to church on Sundays, and then afterwards we'd go around the corner to a little coffee, Italian coffee shop. Mm -hmm. and they made espresso. Mm -hmm. We get espresso and a pastry, and then they had opera in the background. Oh. It's really very picturesque. Yeah, yeah. So we did little things like that. Mm -hmm. We used to take rides up to Wilmette and Winnetka to see all, where all the rich people live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, other than that, we really didn't do much because we couldn't afford it. Right. I loved Marshall Fields, but they wouldn't give us a charge card because I was the one working and Craig was the student. Oh, so they didn't put stock into your uh -uh. employment. Uh-uh. And of course, it was before credit cards, mm -hmm. and we didn't qualify for a gasoline card. So everything was cash on the line, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which was kind of interesting. Of course, you don't build up a lot of debts that way. True, true. Yeah, and when we, we moved home in January, and uh, we needed a new battery in the car, so these friends of Craig said, well, we'll put it in for you. You'll save some money. But they put it in wrong. And we didn't get any farther than Gary, Indiana, before the car wouldn't run. Mm -hmm. And we were near a truck station, so we went in there. 
And they say, well, they could fix it, but we'd have to wait till the next morning till they got the part. And so there was our little car sitting, and there were all these huge trucks all around it. And they said, and you can go upstairs and go to sleep. So we went upstairs, and there must have been a hundred beds in this place. Uh -huh. And here we were, and I said, I'm afraid to go to sleep. I'm afraid <laughs> a big trucker will come in. <laughs> and then we went through all these alternators and generators on the way home. We got to Akron, and we didn't have any lights or anything, and we had to stop at a motel. And the man at the motel allowed us to call home. We thought maybe somebody could come get us. Nobody was home. We called everybody we knew. Nobody was home, and he felt so sorry for us. And so he said, take my car and go out and get something to eat. That's nice. So we did, but we were so nervous that we got there, and, and the food just choked in our throats. We were so nervous. Uh -huh. So we came back, and the next morning we woke up, but we couldn't go out before the sun came up because we didn't have any lights in the car. Mm -hmm. We were so hungry. And that's before, our, it was our stupid fault for not carrying food with us, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and water. Right. We were so hungry, we, we got to this little diner, and I thought, orange juice, <laughs> please, right away. <laughs> Oh gosh, what a horrible. Oh, and then on the way home, the muffler got a hole in it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we were really in sad shape. You were lucky just to make it back. I know, <laughs> I know. No lights, a hole in the muffler, no gasoline card. It was, you know, really scary when you think, at least if you have credit cards and everything, you've got something. Mm -hmm. Right. We right. had nothing. Right. Wow. We didn't have that much money to start with, but we really didn't have any money when we got home. Right. So that's why I went back to Hopkins and okay. worked for a while until we, until he passed. And then the, the chiropractor in Westminster had a heart attack, and Craig came up and worked under his license oh, okay. Okay. for a while. And then when the fella uh, got better, he fired Craig. And here we are with a new baby and a house. Oh, my goodness. That was, oh, no. that was a tragic time. I think one thing when you get older, you realize that these things, these awful things that happen along the way, really aren't so awful. You live through them. Yeah. But sometime it's over. Right, right. You get past it. It's mm -hmm. just, in those moments, you think, how Oh, yeah, you think it's the end of the world. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's so... Okay, so you have one son, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so at that point, you're here in this house, mm -hmm. um, just the three of you, right? So then, oh. go ahead, I'm sorry. All on the first floor, because we couldn't afford to fix up the second floor. Oh, okay. That was our bedroom. Okay, all right. With your son, too? Did you mm -hmm. share the With room? the crib. And we had a big black dog. And the grandparents were all upset because they thought the dog was going to hurt the baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> we went to Ascension Church, mm -hmm. and the priest there was very, very proper. High church it was then. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, I'd like to make an appointment to have my baby baptized before the dog eats him. <laughs> <laughs> so we had this baptism of services. And when it was over, this very staid priest looked at me and winked, and he says, well, we made it. <laughs> I just want to interject. You have such a great sense of humor. You oh, really well, you well, really you do. have to sometimes. Yes, it makes it a lot easier. Yes, so I really, I love your sense of humor. Well, as I said to Craig when we were in Chicago, I said, I said, well, you know, if I had the money, I'd take the train home. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't stay here. And I said, I don't mind starting from the bottom, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> and of course, I was 25. It's not like I was a teenager. Right, right. And I'd been working on my own. Mm -hmm. So 
So then how old were you when you had your son? Almost 30. Okay. So that was a little different then at that time too, right? Right. Like very much so. Yeah. Would, normally people would have been a much, much younger. Yeah. Right. Well, most of the people got married right out of college and mm -hmm. so they were... They were, right. Mm -hmm, ready to go. Right, right. And I was just kind of wandering around. Mm -hmm. But I, I ha I'm not sorry. And then when I realized, I realized that I had no security. If Craig got sick, mm -hmm. there would be nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started, you know, reaching out and doing little jobs here and there. Mm 